Good evening, and welcome to a question and answer session regarding the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. My name is Joseph Thornley, CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for virtual consultation. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event, and in that role, I'll work to keep the event on time, ensure your questions are answered as best as possible, and make sure as many questions are answered as possible. One important note, if you require closed captioning, you can turn that on by clicking on the CC symbol at the bottom of your video screen. So closed captioning is available. This evening's se session is scheduled to run until 8 p.m. We will begin with an update from Metrolinx on the design for the tunnel connection into Mount Dennis Station. You can find the presentation from tonight's meeting right below uh, the video screen, and you can download it later for reference. After the presentation, the panelists will answer your questions. We'll begin the question and answer session by drawing on the written questions that have been submitted by you prior to this meeting. Now, in reviewing those questions, we found that there were a lot of questions and a lot of duplication. So what uh, we've tried to do is draw those questions together. Uh, and so you won't see me asking your exact words, but what we've done is consolidated a number of questions so that we can cover as many topics as possible. So we will be asking those questions to people. If you don't hear your question asked, you can always add it to the written questions and Metrolinx in the days coming will be making an effort to make sure that they have responded to all the major topics. We also have a call-in option for tonight's event. So if you'd like to actually ask your question orally out loud, you can click on the yellow Join Zoom button that is, again, right below the video window where you're watching it right now. And when you do uh, join the Zoom room, Kelly Thornton will be there, and she'll be your host on that Zoom room. We'll be taking call-in questions after we've done the written questions, and we'll cover them in the order in which you put your hand up once you're over there. So that's available to you. You don't need to go into the Zoom room right now. You can watch the presentation and then go there uh, after the presentation. If you do go to the Zoom room, we'd ask that you try and keep your question on point and brief. Uh, we found in the past that uh, there are a lot of questions and we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask their question. So before we begin the meeting, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In particular, these lands are covered by 20 treaties, and we have a responsibility to recognize and value the rights of Indigenous nations and peoples and conduct business in a manner that is built on the foundation of trust, respect, and collaboration. Metrolinx is committed to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and to working towards meaningful reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. So, I'd now like to introduce you to Josh Engel Yan, who will deliver the safety statement and also be our lead presenter. Thanks very much, Joseph. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here and thank you for making the time. Uh, we like to start all, all of our meetings with a safety moment. Um, and last week was Rail Safety Week. Um, so uh, Metrolinx was engaged in a lot of activities to promote safety around our rail corridors. And an important part of that is our level crossings or grade crossings. These are places where the actual tracks uh, pedestrians or motorists actually cross the tracks, whether it's a path or a road. And every week, more than 1 million cars and over 50,000 pedestrians and cyclists travel across our grade crossing. So, of course, safety in those crossings is very important. Um, there are pedestrian gates with flashing lights and bells uh, for, for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, a, as well as to show motorists uh, when a train is coming. But what you can do to ensure safety is A, of course, to always obey the signals, uh, but B, and this is a big part for 
you know, all transportation safety is to pay attention and not to be distracted, uh, to so to avoid, you know, uh, uh, any uh, being in the path of an oncoming train. And really, you know, the especially when it comes to the GO trains, it's it's difficult for them to stop quickly. Uh, so it's really important that people and, and everyone uh, are as safe as possible around our grade crossings. And we do have a blog post that's linked here uh, in the slides. Uh, if you would like more detail about the things that we're doing to promote safety around our grade crossings. Uh, so now that we've gone through the safety moment, I'm happy to introduce the panel for this evening. Uh, so we have Elmira, who's a project manager with Metrolinx uh, and uh, has been in some of our previous public engagements as well. Uh, we have a couple of new faces uh, for our virtual engagement. So Sean Arnold, uh, is our design team lead with our technical advisor. And Yan Wu is also a guideway and J uh, technical advisor for the guideway and the Jane portal. And if you don't know what I mean by the Jane portal, you will you will see soon through the slides. Uh, we also have a few folks uh, if there are more detailed questions in the wings. So we have John Potter, our Metrolinx design manager, Michelle Jen, Jen Croce, who is our, with our property group, as well as Amir Iravani, who's with our technical advisory team for noise and vibration. We wanna make sure that we can answer all your questions. So we've assembled that team. And of course, Kelly will be in the Zoom room. So if we head to the next slide, uh, the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension is really made up of three uh, key pieces. So we have the tunneled section starting in the west from Renforth to just before Scarlet, which is about six and a half kilometers. We have the elevated guideway from Scarlet to Jane across the Humber River Valley, uh, which is approximately one and a half kilometers. And then we have a short tunneled section uh, from the area around Pierin Park into the Mount Dennis station that's currently under construction as part of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll I'll refer to these three pieces, but that's just a high level navigation of of the project, a 9.2 kilometers from Mount Dennis to Renforth, and of course we're also working on the planning of the future connection from Renforth Renforth to Pearson Airport. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you know it is going to be uh, a, an active an active fall for the project. I think Joseph uh, was mentioning it was our seventh uh, virtual engagement on the project, and certainly there will be more coming through the fall. Um, so in June, we did our, our first uh, detailed engagement on the elevated guideway, and we will be coming back with more details uh, and to answer more of your questions in October uh, on the elevated guideway. Also this year, we'll be coming to you with more on the preliminary design of stations and ancillary buildings. That's things like emergency exit buildings and traction power substations. Tonight, the bulk of the content is focused on the tunneled connection into Mount Dennis Station. So that's that a short 500 meter section, uh, tunneled section. And we are in the design of that section right now. So your input into these elements really helps us uh, advance and refine those designs. Uh, and then just a, a little bit of a hint at kind of the overall delivery approach. So we've talked about the advanced tunnel, which is currently under construction, the, the twin tunnel from Renforth to Scarlet. And then we've talked about the second part of the project, which is called the station rail and systems component of the contract. Uh, we have been hearing from the community uh, about way about questions about if we could advance uh, the tunneled section and the elevated guideway, but especially the tunneled section faster through Mount Dennis. Uh, we've also been in discussions with uh, folks in the in the construction industry and understand that you know breaking up the the project into smaller pieces creates the opportunity uh, for mo more folks to bid on the project and to create greater interest. So we are looking at opportunities to create some smaller construction packages and begin some of the work sooner. I don't have too many details on that, but certainly stay tuned for an update. And so if you hear us hinting at something like this could happen as early as that, that reflects uh, the work to try and advance some of this work. So moving to the next slide, um, 
this is some of our timelines uh, with targeting the opening of the line in 2031. The tunnel from Renforth to Scarlet, that's the orange piece, is under construction right now. There's lots of work happening at Renforth uh, and Eglinton and you know more to come on that but um, that tunneling project will be complete by in 2025 the the purple section the mount dennis tunnel and the elevated guideway shown here starting in 2024 again we're looking at ways to advance both of those pieces of work and then there's basically everything else the tracks the signals the communication systems uh, that would follow that follow starting in 24. Um, so continuing to move, that just orients you in terms of timing. Uh, here's a little bit more detail through an aerial map of the area from Scarlet all the way to the, the rail corridor. So you can see in, uh, in Mauve is the elevated guideway uh, that goes across the Humber River Valley with elevated stations at Scarlet and at Jane Street. And then the shaded section in yellow is the Mount Dennis tunneled section. So starting just around Pier and Park, uh, you'll see in a minute a little bit of a better, uh, a more detailed illustration, but how the trains will go from the elevated section into the underground section through Mount Dennis. And there's really three pieces to that. There's that portal shaft access. Uh, that's where the, the tracks go into the ground. Uh, there's the tunneled section, which is about 500 meters. That's the blue segment. And then there's the access shaft. That's where the tunneling equipment uh, is taken out of the ground. Uh, so we need to make a shaft there to be able to access that equipment. Um, uh, so if we just go to the next slide. This is the first time I, I think uh, many folks will be seeing this. This is an illustration and we are this is going to come up again in a few slides when Yen is talking to this in some more detail. But really, I just wanted to highlight the overall pieces so that you can picture it in your head as we're talking about the different pieces of, of the project. So this uh, illustration or rendering is viewing south. Uh, so that that uh, street right on the right side of the image is Jane Street. Uh, the area with the baseball, oh, the area with the baseball diamond on the left is Purin Park, and uh, it's Eglinton Flats. Uh, that's sort of the main section. So you can see the elevated section of the of the line transitioning into a portal where it curves uh, underground to go underneath the Eglinton Avenue for the remaining section of the tunnel into Mount Dennis. Again, we'll we'll talk more about this, so I, I'm just going to keep moving um, and Yen and Sean will get into more detail about what's there and and why and uh, how some of those uh, how that thinking has evolved. So if we go to the next slide. We've been in lots of discussions with the community with our key partners at City of Toronto, TTC, TRCA, City of Mississauga, uh, as well as uh, with elected officials, uh, as as recent as participating in a in a Jane's Walk in the Humber River Valley this weekend. Um, so we've been hearing a lot of different things already uh, around some of your key considerations. And as I said before, we are in the reference uh, design development stage. So that's the documents that we put into our procurements to uh, describe what the project should be and and what the the construction firm should build. And this is the this is a really good time for you to provide your input. So some of the key things that we've heard so far that we're considering are into the design. So one, as I mentioned, was to build the tunnel faster and sooner to reduce uh, the time and the length of construction impacts and see how we can advance that. Um, another one was to maintain park access and uh, the park amenities and and you will see that uh, the both through construction and, and final operation access to Pier and Park access to Eglinton Flats will be maintained to Fergie Brown Park, excuse me, not Eglinton Flats, uh, will be maintained that the cricket pitches, that the baseball diamonds are, are not affected. Um, and that we've been working closely with City of Toronto to keep the staging uh, um, area as small as possible. Um, 
we'll, we've been working to push the guideway as close to the road as we can to minimize the impact to trees. Um, and as well, and we've talked about this in the past, that the tunneled section will be a uh, kind of a boring method, which means that it's not a cut and cover method where you dig up uh, the entire road and then you need to have uh, you know lane closures and things like that. Um, and that's more disruptive. So this is a board method where the for the bulk of the section of the tunnel, it's just really where you put the equipment in under the into the ground and where you take it out that you will see impacts at the surface. We'll be protecting and we'll talk about uh, making sure we don't have any impacts to the historically significant Scotiabank building and we'll be maximizing opportunities for greenery around the guideways and portals and we'll look to future engagements about public realm and ways we can work with you to identify ways to enhance the public realm uh, for all in in all sorts of ways both in and around the guideway and, and the tunnel portal so those are that's something to come so next slide please So just in terms of the parks, because obviously this is a this is a very important piece. So you can see here Fergie Brown Park on the left and then Puran Park on the right. Um, as I mentioned, we will not be impacting the cricket pitches, the baseball diamond during construction or the operation of the line. Uh, you'll see there's some areas closer to Eglinton that will be temporarily impacted for construction staging. That's in particular where the elevated guideway goes into the portal uh, to go into the tunnel. Um, and, and we are going to be working with you as well as the City of Toronto to look at ways that we can uh, make improvements to the park or add new amenities through the construction uh, of this work. So stay tuned for some more detailed public engagement on that. And then uh, finally, before I hand it off uh, to Yen is the next slide. Uh, so clearly uh, trees are very important. This is a beautiful natural area of the city. Uh, we have been working hard on a tree inventory and arborist report to understand uh, both to assess and to minimize impact to trees in the area. Of course, there will need to be some tree removals, um, both of you know smaller and and depending on the location, different types of trees. So we have a tree compensation policy in place. And uh, this is kind of pioneering our approach at Metrolinx where we are really looking to do as much as we can planting of trees in advance of any removals. So there will be locations along the corridor where we can do tree planting uh, very soon. And so st uh, stay tuned, we'll be announcing opportunities for planting uh, through the end of this year and early next year. Um, so that's really the goal of planting trees now to ensure they can grow during the construction period. But then in areas which are directly impacted by construction, uh, we'll be doing the planting afterwards. Uh, so with that, I will pass it on to Yen to talk in a little bit more detail uh, about the Mount Dennis Tunnel and the portal. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, so as Josh described, uh, we're illustrating here an aerial view of the portal just east of Jane Street, um, showing the point where the tracks emerge from underground to the elevated segment. Um, this guideway transition will happen primarily <clears throat> in the form of an underground box, um, then um, continues as an open trench structure as the alignment comes up to grade level and then a ramp structure until the guideway achieves um, sufficient headroom to span over Jane Street. Um, we understand the importance of um, the green recreational spaces for the community and the park users. Um, therefore, we are trying to stay as close as possible to Eglinton Avenue uh, in order to minimize the impacts of the park while also ensuring that uh, vehicular and pedestrian access to Fergie Brown Park uh, can be maintained at all times during the construction phases. Um, next one, please. So I'm going to elaborate on the, um, on the site a little bit further. So as noted in the previous slide, the guideway transitions between the underground and elevated segment 
um, noted in blue, here is the on the ground segment and in pink line is the elevated segment. There will be a short open trench section in order to facilitate this transition. And uh, also it will serve as access shaft for the construction of the tunnel portion. Um, that is shown here in the yellow box in this image. So to ensure pedestrian and cyclist safety during construction, the connection um, will be diverted to a multi-use path on the south side of Eglinton Avenue with a dedicated crosswalk. Um, we have been working very closely with the City of Toronto on the reinstatement of, of this path after the portal construction. Um, also to accommodate the guideway alignment, the existing road access to Fergie Brown Park, as can see there on the, in the middle of the image there, uh, it will need to be rerouted due to headroom limitations. Um, the existing access, however, will remain open until the new road is completed and then traffic is switched over. So access to Fergie Brown Park will be maintained at all times. A lot of thinking has gone into finding the best option for the access road to the park, uh, which I will summarize in the next slide. Um, however, before moving on, I'll just uh, make a short pause on this page. There's a lot of information to take in, um, give you a bit of time to process this image. Thank you. Next one, please. Uh, the previous one. Thank you. So um, we recognize that unrestricted access to the recreational facilities is important to the community. Uh, so to that end, we have been working hard investigating different alternatives to achieve this and also how to best minimize the potential impacts to the green spaces, um, the floodplain, natural heritage, and uh, the public transit users and connection to the bus routes as well. So after months of studies and consultations with stakeholders and City of Toronto, we have come up with a solution that has the most balanced and uh, least disruptive outcome. So the recommended access road is shown here in the lower right corner of the image. Uh, we are able to maintain full in and out access from Eglinton Avenue, um, no impacts to the floodplain, and uh, it overall reduces the impacts of the park and the park users. Next one, please. Um, and now I will ha be handing over to my colleague, Sean, to talk through the tunnel and the connection to Mount Dennis. Thank you, Yen. OK, so um, just on the slide here, we're showing the the main tunnel alignment. So this is the piece of the alignment that connects the Jane portal through to the uh, tail tracks of the existing or the under construction Mount Dennis station. Uh, it's approximately 500 metres long and um, our proposal at the moment is that it would be a board type of construction, as Josh has alluded to earlier. And that was a decision that we took relatively early on, just mindful of the potential impacts to the community that uh, an open excavation could have in a relatively narrow right of way. So things like um, restricted property access, uh, traffic disruption and utility diversions. We wanted to try and avoid all of that and those uh, negative community impacts. So the decision, as I said, was taken to use a, a board tunnelling method. So that can be either by um, a purpose-built tunnel boring machine or by uh, a mind type approach and we're leaving that open at the moment uh, and that's that's the way we're progressing forward so the tunnel will be approximately 14 meters 12 to 14 meters underground um, but we we will be mitigating the the vibration impacts such that uh, you know vibration should be imperceptible to the limits uh, to human limits uh, and and one of the, the good things about putting the tunnel directly in the right of way is we don't need to acquire any homes on either side of the Eglinton Avenue. Um, so, so that also provides a good positive community impact. Next slide, please. And at the connection piece, this is the, the, the uh, access shaft. So on the screen here on the image on the right, you can see 
where the access shaft would be located approximately. So we have the, the go tracks on the right hand side of the image, Eglinton Avenue just in the centre, Scotiabank immediately to the west and the access shaft is immediately adjacent to the Mount Dennis Station west entrance. So the key thing here is the access shaft will serve as a point of, of access for uh, the construction crews to get into the tunnel uh, and to construct the works from this location. They may use it to extract uh, machinery and equipment and to uh, uh, bring concrete and other, other um, materials into the, the tunnels. Uh, a key aspect of this is that we want to, we will be maintaining access into Mount Dennis Station throughout construction. So there, there will be continued access throughout the whole construction period. We do predict that work in this area would begin as early as potentially 2023. Um, so this, you know, the, the work would get underway relatively quickly. Um, and another key concern, obviously, is the impact of traffic here. And there's been a, obviously a lot of disruption with the Crosstown project. So we're mindful of that and we're going to do our best to mitigate the impacts to traffic. Uh, currently, we, we think there will be one, one potential lane closure on Eglinton Avenue West. Um, so I think that that's one, one lane closure at the moment. And yes, at the moment, we are also looking at the construction timelines and sequencing to provide the most efficient projects in terms of disruption to the area. Um, the Scotia Bank itself is a heritage building and we have done an initial assessment of the impacts due to ground movement induced by the tunnelling. And, and those results are showing that the Scotia Bank would experience negligible impact due to the tunnelling that we're proposing. OK, next slide, please. And with that, I'll pass it back to Josh to to wrap up. Great. Thank you, Sean and Yen. Um, so I, I'm starting to be a bit of a broken record, but uh, we're we're developing the reference design. So the again highlighting, um, we're really looking forward to your input in in particular on the on the Mount Dennis Tunnel section, uh, and your questions. Um, we are continuing our regular cadence uh, of these virtual engagements until we can hopefully at some point transition uh, to having more uh, in-person type events and exciting that we've already started to do some of those things where it's possible and safe like the outdoor participating in the outdoor uh, Jane's Walk over the weekend in the Humber River Valley. Um, and we'll also continue with the smaller group engagements and please uh, we'll provide our contact info again in a moment, but reach out to us if you want to have a, a smaller uh, individual or smaller group discussions. So we'll continue to provide information as it becomes available. Um, you can see here at the image is actually a picture of the of the hoarding. So the fencing around the Renforth and Eglinton launch shaft construction. Um, so you start to see the information about the future ridership, the maps and uh, safety around uh, trucks that come in and out of the site. Uh, so if any of you have gone by there, you will have seen that uh, that's work is underway right now. And then finally, if we just move to the next slide. Uh, here's our contact information, whether it's the website, phone, email. Uh, we also have our, our Twitter handle that we regularly put out information. Um, so please uh, continue to stay in touch if you have uh, questions or feedback. And I'll pass it back to you, Joseph. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. And thank you, Amira, Yen, and Sean for that presentation. So there's a lot that's there. Of course, we also have questions that were asked in advance, uh, and a few of them are tough, uh, but um, what I've tried to do is pull them together uh, so that um, the major areas are covered. So right off the top, it's pretty clear that some residents oppose the elevated guideway and feel that it will destroy the parks and make it difficult or impossible to have a Jane Street LRT in the future because of the elevated Jane Street. So first question to the team, why is an elevated guideway being built when examples around the world demonstrate that it is possible to tun tunnel underneath a water body easily? Uh, okay, thanks, Joseph. Uh, I can start. Um, 
just in terms of re responding to that and uh, definitely in August we were also having a lot of back and forth on the, on the elevated guideway. Uh, we, we understand that there are a number of people that um, you know would like it to be underground and and I don't think we've ever said that that is the technically of course um, you know you have lots of examples where tunnels are built under under waterways. It's not that it's technically not feasible. Um, it's really a, a number of considerations. So really from in our business case and the broader analysis of benefits, there's also some technical reasons and then there's also local considerations. So in our initial business case that was published in February of 2020, we looked at a number of options. It, it included the, the current option uh, that the uh, the mixed option between elevated and tunneled, as well as a fully tunneled option um, with uh, nine stations. Uh, that option uh, was approximately $1.1 billion more than the, than the current mixed option. Um, and part of that is really because to, to tunnel underneath the Humber River Valley, um, you, you need to go approximately 100 feet or nine stories uh, below ground level to get sufficiently under the Humber. Uh, that means uh, that, and just for context, that's about 10 meters deeper than any of the excavation that's happening at, uh, you know, Eglinton West for the Crosstown, so to Cedarvale Station um, or, or at Young. Young and Eglinton, so though there would be a lot more construction impacts from those really deep station construction at Scarlet and Jane. Uh, the other thing is that through the business case, uh, we found that the the mixed option provided the best uh, travel time, the highest ridership, uh, the most travel time savings, and the most increase to the access to jobs, um, uh, which is you know the reason why we're proceeding with that approach. Uh, clearly, there are a lot of uh, specific concerns we've heard from the community about park access, about tree impacts, about access to wildlife and birds in particular that we are uh, we've heard and we're trying to address and and mitigate all of those. The other thing is that we're looking at ways that the public guideway, uh, sorry, the elevated guideway can allow us to make public realm improvements. So that's both. Uh, active spaces or open spaces under the guideway and and adjacent to it and we'll we're looking forward to more uh, meaningful engagement with the community about those opportunities um, so that's that's really where where things are at um, and I, I think that that probably sums up the the key reasons why the the mix option thanks Joseph okay thank you for that Josh let me follow up because you talked about meaningful engagement and several of the questioners express, express skepticism about Metrolinx's consultation process. Um, they feel that um, the, the, it feels more like you are making presentations telling taxpayers what Metrolinx is doing. Um, and they want to have more of an opportunity to give you information based on their experience and have you listen and then act upon the community feedback. Um, then they they argue that you'd be in a position to advise the elected government about how to allocate the taxpayers dollars in the best interests of the community. So can you respond directly to this question about whether you are presenting and informing or whether you're really listening? Thanks, Joseph. Um, I, I, I can answer this one. I'm not going to answer every question, but I can definitely answer this one. Uh, again, a, a appreciate the question and really appreciate that uh, people in the community want to give meaningful uh, feedback and we want to do meaningful engagement. As I mentioned, this is our seventh virtual engagement. Um, even in today, we are trying to reflect uh, the key questions and concerns that we're hearing and we're trying to show you how we're integrating those into the design. Um, of course, there's always room for us to do better. Uh, we were just talking with one of the local councillors today about how we can set up uh, both surveys as well as in-person 
uh, you know, outdoor meetings on site at Pier and Park at Fergie Brown. Uh, so look forward to that to have, you know, more face to face type of virtual engagement. You know, do appreciate that uh, because of COVID virtual engagement is is good, but maybe not great uh, in every regard. Um, the, the other thing is, I, I mean, it, it is true that not everything is open to input uh, along the way. Um, there are some decisions that we have made, uh, you, you know, for example, the recommendation about the uh, the mixed alignment and the elevated guideway um, that came out of the business case that we were responsible for for producing. Um, but the, we're really trying to address the most common issues and concerns that we're hearing from residents, um, whether that's about the park access or tree impacts or the look and feel or the space underneath the guideway and uh, ways to improve the public realm. So I, I definitely say our our goal is meaningful engagement. Yes, um, you know, not not everything is always up for for discussion, but we're trying to reflect what we're hearing and incorporate that into the design as 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 well as we can. And we're open also to suggestions on how we can do that better. OK, um, we're seven meetings into this process and of course, uh, repetition very often does lead to people asking tough questions. So one more process question. Um, at previous meetings, uh, some of the answers uh, have been basically amounted to you really should go and ask the TTC uh, about that topic. So um, is it possible for you to include a TTC representative in these ECWE meetings so that uh, when a person asks a question right here, uh, they can get the answer even if it's not coming directly from you? That's a great suggestion. Um, we are meeting, you know, very regularly with City of Toronto, TTC, TRCA, City of Mississauga uh, staff and uh, elected officials. Um, but clearly, uh, you know, the Eglinton Crosstown West does not exist as an island as part of a network. So the whole seamless connection between ECWE and the, the buses and other other forms of transit is really important. Um, so we'd, we'd be happy to include TTC representatives at future engagement, uh, in particular, if there's sort of a focus on uh, the whole, you know, bus plan and integration. Um, so we'll we're happy to reach out to them to see if there's ways that we can involve them uh, in, in future engagements and we appreciate the recommendation. OK, thanks. Um, so um, a few questions about uh, the construction. So um, one question is um, at its highest point within one foot, including the clear barriers and overhead power poles, how high above grade would the guideway be? So all in, how high will the guideway be? Likewise, um, how high above the grade would the two proposed stations at Jane and Scarlet be? So can you talk about how high these things will be along the alignment and at the stations, please? Great. Uh, Elmira, can I pass this one to you? Uh, absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, and thanks for the question. Uh, so elevated guideway have like uh, have different clearance. Uh, you can see under elevated guideway, but like looking at Jane because of the requirements for uh, transit safety or vehicular uh, safety underneath the guideway, we need certain clearance. Considering that six meter clearance and the deck, um, the, uh, the depth of the um, like beams and uh, the deck itself and the train and the poles. We are looking at around like 15 meters from Eglinton. Um, it's it's approximately around 15 meters. So. And uh, Elmira, could you clarify the height to between the the road to the to the to the base of the guideway and then the guideway up to the like just give that stratification. So from the road uh, to underneath the guideway, we need six meter clearance at Jane, and we have another two, three meter for the beams and for the deck itself. And then 
Above that, we, we will see like poles um, um, and also train. So, on top of the station, also considering all the canopy, we are looking uh, at 15 meter. So that's uh, that's a change, but it it could be different along the guideway. But at the station, that is the height that we are looking at. Okay. So I don't know, Sean or Yan, do you want to add anything? Yeah, perhaps um, just uh, adding to what Elmira explained. Um, obviously, um, this has not been shared. This information has not been uh, communicated to the public yet. There will be an upcoming engagement uh, in October, and it will include some renderings with uh, with the breakdown of um, of the clearances clearly it's of interest to the public and i will take that into consideration and present that in the next uh, upcoming engagement thank you thank you uh, a question about sound barriers um, the bird mortality rate associated with clear barriers and glass windows is is quite high um, we understand that the Morse code dot pattern graphics that are being used in the sound barriers are unique to Metrolinx, therefore experimental, and that risks bird collisions and deaths. There are a number of threatened species under the ESA that migrate, breed, and live within the Eglinton Flats. Have you got any real world case studies that prove that the Morse code dot pattern graphics are an adequate deterrent? Thanks for this question, Joseph. Uh, I'm going to pass it to uh, somebody who's the, you can't see their face, but they're not on camera, but John Potter. Can you respond to that question, please? Yes, and thank you for that question. So um, just to put the the sort of the Metrolinx pattern as the Morse code pattern in perspective, it is built upon um, City of Toronto standards you know which have been recently updated in the latest version of the toronto green standard and what's called the csa standard which basically sets the standard on which all municipalities base their own bird friendly pattern requirements so you know though you're seeing a, a morse code in fact underpinning that um that design is the standard uh, bird friendly pattern. Uh, you know, the Morse code is, you know, adds a little extra density to it, partly because, um, you know, for maintenance reasons, like the, it, it sort of conceals, you know, dust and dirt a bit better than, a, you know, clear glass, a totally clear glass barrier. And it also carry some meaning and adds kind of amenity to the infrastructure. So yes, um, the pattern is based on the established norms and, you know, it's basically builds on that and creates uh, a kind of a visual uh, look and feel or a, the visual appearance is something that we feel is fitting for our infrastructure and our stations. Thanks, Josh. Thank you for that, John. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions here that have been pre-submitted, and then we'll go to Kelly Thornton in the Zoom room. So again, if you would like to ask your question out loud, uh, if it's a new question based on tonight's presentation, for example, just click on the Join Zoom, the yellow button that's below the video, and Kelly will be there, and uh, she will uh, be ready to take your questions. So. Um, a question about accessibility um, and uh, some people are asking a bundle of questions about the preliminary station designs when they'll be able to see them uh, things like color will the stations all be exactly the same color like the rest of the line or are you planning to make wayfinding easier by having stations that are different colors and therefore more easily distinguished from uh, one another how about stairways? Will they have bicycle runnels? What about wheelchair and stroller runnels or ramps? When the power goes out uh, and people are unable to use escalators, what are the alternatives? Um, 
so can you talk about uh, the, when people will see the station designs and um, and about the accessibility considerations? Uh, thanks, Joseph. I can I can start, um, and then I'll I'll pass it I'll pass it over to Sean, and then maybe John if there's a, a little bit more detail to add. Um, first of all, I'll I'll say that we have planned public engagement uh, this fall already that will start to focus on the stations uh, and into next year. So there'll be a lot more detail. Uh, for people to to understand about you know some of the questions that have been raised, I'll start just in terms of design. Uh, I mean, this is an extension of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, so there does need to be a reference between uh, these stations and the Crosstown stations. It doesn't mean they have to be exactly the same, but there will be a number of, you know, visual cues and similarities from an accessibility perspective. Uh, we will have both redundant escalators and elevators uh, to ensure that if you know if something goes out of service, that there is still an accessible path, um, and that there are things like backup power in place. So this isn't just like one power source to in, to ensure that you know power outages uh, don't shut the system down. Um, so that is part of the system. Um, in terms of uh, the 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 runnels or the bike i i don't have an answer to that one i think it's an interesting idea um so certainly something that we could talk about in more detail at upcoming engagements uh, sean was there anything you wanted to add to that thanks josh yeah i think you covered most of the things pretty well um but yeah i mean essentially what we're trying to do is to recognize that this is a is a system it, eventually it will become one one line so you want everything to talk to each other in terms of wayfinding um, and kind of stationed families and, and how how architecturally they might speak to each other. Um, and yeah, I think that also what you said about the the access, I think that's a, a good point. We will be having redundancy in vertical circulation, so two sets of escalators and and elevators at each uh, station. So, you know, that that will provide some backup if there is uh, maintenance or anything like that. Um, and power, again, there will be redundancy in the system, as Josh has alluded to. So, yeah, that's that's all built into the design. And maybe I'll add just a conclusion to this. It's I, I thought it was very interesting that um, the question included a part that Delt asked about what we call intuitive wayfinding, what you, how will you identify which station you're at without relying on signage? And, uh, you know, I think to what Josh said, you know, we're looking, you know, we're, this is an extension to line. So there's going to be elements of continuity in terms of the station design for the Eglinton Crosstown, the LRT project that's almost complete and the extension we're working on. But also there is going to be elements of variability, those things that support intuitive wayfinding. And that is, you know, what Sean and his team will be working on in the coming months is striking that balance. And of course, you know, incorporating all the lessons learned that have you know come up in the last six seven years since we designed and put out to market the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And and for people who are watching, that was John Potter uh, who uh, provided the last part of that answer. Thank you very much, John. Okay, final question from me before we go over to Kelly in the Zoom room. And again, if you want to join her and ask a question out loud, click on the yellow join Zoom button and you'll be able to be heard. So you're designing a great system. Uh, it's going to provide connections between the TTC, Up Express, My Way, Go Buses at Renfrew. But affordability is an issue. Having to pay twice to move from system to system can be expensive for workers on a tight budget. Um, will you, Metrolinx, recommend to the government ways to mitigate the cost of a trip between two systems, such as from Martin Grove to Mississauga City Center? 
that's a great question, uh, Joseph. Thank you. Uh, thanks to that question. And yeah, getting at you know the some of the key other things other than what we build that affects the how people can use the line and how affordable it is and what benefits it provides. So certainly, fare integration is is an important uh, ongoing discussion. Um, our base assumptions in the business case. Uh, are that you do have to pay an extra fare when you transfer between uh, TTC and MyWay, as is the case today. Um, but but part of the assumption in the business case was that you know you could travel the full length of the Eglinton West extension without uh, you know and into Mississauga without paying an extra fare as long as you stay on that line. Um, so most 905 transit transit agencies today have fare integration with each other. There's also uh, you, you know a reduced fare when you transfer from uh, the 905 transit agencies to Go Transit. Um, so lots of work happening in that space. We're we're working with the the province and our partner transit agencies towards a regional solution. So it's not a you know detailed and precise answer, but to say yes, very important point. Uh, important to the benefits of the line, importance of its ability to really connect people between Toronto, and Mississauga, and uh, there is certainly a lot of work happening in that space and more information to come. Thank you very much for that, Josh. So we've done a we've covered a lot of ground here uh, with these questions. Um, there are probably a bunch of questions in the Zoom right room right now, so let's check with Kelly Thornton about who's there and uh, Kelly. Are, can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Joseph. All right. Um, we do have a full house over here, and uh, the 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 list of folks who want to ask questions. Several of them are multiple questions, so uh, we will kick it off with Rick, who has a few questions. So, Rick, uh, you are welcome to unmute yourself at any time and ask your question. Hi, sorry. Um, I guess a concern about the um, the Montana station end um, with the access tunnel or the access to take the machines out, the tunneling machines out and um, put them in, I guess. Um, is that not the functional station entrance? And how are you going to protect people? Um, also, are you going to be uh, providing underground uh, pedestrian connection from the south side of Eglinton to the station at any point? Okay, so we'll get started with that. So yes, it is the it, it is the plaza area that that you see on the on the diagram, and we'll head over to Josh and maybe Sean or Yen who can speak more to the design. Yeah, I was going to pass it to Sean to respond to that Rick's question. Yeah, hi, hi Rick. Thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, great question. So as you you know, as you you're kind of alluding to there, it's it's a very constrained area that we're we're looking at for the location of this of this access shaft. Um, so what I can say is that we will be fully segregating that worksite area from any pedestrian access into the station, so that. The, the access is safe for pedestrian users. Um, but we have also um, undertaken some constructability studies to ensure that that work site is, is fit for purpose and, and can be used to, to, um, to construct the tunnel to remove equipment as necessary. Uh, and then I think the other part of your question was about an underground connection across Eglinton. That isn't part of the, the, uh, the, the current project. Um, we will be looking at, at maintaining good pedestrian connectivity. Uh, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll be coming to this forum with, with more details in due course. I hope that answers Thank your you. question, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Did you want to ask any of the other questions? No? Um, okay, if not, we will head over to Neeland. Uh, you're up next, Neeland, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi there, thanks for taking uh, my question and comment. Um, I live in Mount Dennis and I think 
many of us in Mount Dennis are feeling quite upset about the way that this has all come about and that it's going to be that the elevated is being kind of presented to us as a done deal and that we, you know, um, most of us support Metrolinx and the project going across Eglinton. Um, but one of our biggest assets is that parkland that you're going to be going right through the middle. We know that elevated roadways and guideways are essentially a barrier. Um, we've learned that from the gardener. We've learned that from many other places through planning in Toronto. And so now you're going to be putting an elevated guideway right through the middle of Mount Dennis's best asset. You're going to be cutting off Pier and Park from Fergie Brown for 10 years. Um, and even when it's built, it looks like Pier and Park's going to be cut off from Fergie Brown. Right now, for the kids in this community, they, can, they have a tremendous amount of green space that they can access without crossing roads, without crossing barriers. And, um, and so I, just, I really just wanted to express how disappointed we are that, that it's being presented this way. Um, and I wanted to know um, specifically why, if, if we have to come above ground, why couldn't we do it uh, down the middle of Eglinton at grade? Why is it being chosen to go in the parkland that um, has the cricket pitches and the soccer fields uh, when there is the golf course? Why that's city property? Um, why was that not considered? Um, I mean, I have so many things um, that, I, that I find troubling with the project and I was hoping that you could comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Neilan. So I, 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 um, I assume you've looked at the presentation material. So the, the guideway itself is not being built through the park. Um, none of the, of the recreation space will be impacted by the infrastructure. Um, but I, I understand your point and we'll, we'll pass it over to Josh and team to speak to some of the specifics. Yeah, thank you, Neeland. Um, number of points there. So I'll tr I was just taking some notes. I'll try and work, work through a number of them. Um, first of all, I think you spoke to the, the disconnection between Pier and Park and Fergie Brown. Um, one of the things in working with City of Toronto, uh, we are maintaining uh, path connections between the two parks. So um, that, that will be maintained uh, both during construction and, and in operation. Um, and, and really oh, part of this is about, of course, uh, separating the transit from the traffic. Uh, you know, there obviously there have been many iterations of versions of the line over the, over the years, uh, but this is about ensuring that the transit can be moved quickly and be reliable and efficient. So that's that's part of you know the overall rationale for separating it out from the middle of the road. Um, and and as Kelly said, I think we're trying to push this uh, as close to Eglinton as we can to to minimize impacts to the park. And and finally, and I think we started to get at this in some of our June engagement um, in terms of the space, the design of the guideway. Uh, we we had shown there are a few different options, and we were we were proceeding with the the design which I think had the best uh, aesthetics as, all, as well as the design underneath the guideway and making sure that it can be, you know, there's, it's not just, you know, gravel and uh, unattractive space, that there's grass or other program spaces and it still can be not a barrier to the park, but it can be actually an active and, and permeable space. Uh, Sean, was there anything else you wanted to say there? Uh, Josh, I think you, you captured most things. I think one of the things we've we've been trying to to balance on this project, and it, it is it is a challenge technically, is is to balance the um, the impacts of of the the elevated guideway, both in terms of natural heritage and also on the um, you know transportation links and and the and the uh, road users as well, and and um, you know trying to find that sweet spot where we, we can position the guideway as close as we can to the road um, and reduce as much as possible the impacts to the, the parks is something that we have, have been trying to do from the outset. 
Um, and I think one of the other things I would just say is, uh, you know, the project is is uh, looking to have a station at Scarlet, um, and and that really the, at Scarlet it's a very constrained area. Um, we really have only a, a little strip of land north of Eglinton Avenue at that intersection in which we can place a station. So so putting the, the um, alignment south of Eglinton is 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 not really possible from from that perspective. It has to be on the north side of Eglinton. Um, and and the other final thing I would just say is that we we will um, as much as possible match the current access into the parks. Right. So we're we're not going to take away access that that currently exists. We will be maintaining those accesses, and that's going to be one of the requirements we we implement going forward. And could I just finish up again, Josh? John. Sure, sure, John. Yeah, the one, the last piece I thought we should address. You talked about the Gardner Expressway is a is a, a you know a barrier between the city and its waterfront, and there's no denying that is the case. And you're starting to see the city grow up and over and underneath the the Gardner to make those connections. The elevated guideway is a completely different. Um, you know, scale of infrastructure. And, you know, you talked about, you know, impacts the park. We're, the reason for the guideway to be running parallel to Eglinton is that that is really the transit corridor. We're trying to keep it as close to, this, to the roadway as possible to minimize impacts to the vegetation on the slopes. But the, the key thing is that the guideway is a completely different scale of infrastructure. You will, it, it's raised, you will always be seeing underneath it as you're driving along. It's not, you, you don't have a, a deck for six lanes of traffic plus ramps. It's for, you know, two rail lines. And then from the park, the idea is that you're at a lower elevation. And so the trees on the slope act as a visual screen and so the idea is that from the park you'll see there's no question you'll see the guideway and you'll see the trains but they will be really a background element you've got your visual you've got your vegetative screen and the trees that are on the slope between the park and the guideway in eglinton west thanks john Kelly? OK, uh, thanks, Neeland. Any follow up questions or. If not, we'll we'll move over to our next our next guest is Tanya and Tanya had a couple of questions. So Tanya, you can unmute yourself now. Yes, thank you. So I guess I'm just going to sort of follow up with a similar question. I, I still don't understand why you couldn't have the train go down the middle of Eglinton the way it happens on the Queensway. Uh, just south of Swansea, which it doesn't interrupt traffic. It has a right of way. It's not hard to cross. It's pretty safe. I, I just I don't understand why you would have to elevate it and not just put it in the center of Eglinton before it goes underground again. And I guess the other question I had just to sort of save time was, I'm surprised you're actually doing the the boring as opposed to the cut and cover kind of work. Um, doesn't that cost much more to borrow instead of doing cut and cover. So what was the financial decision or what factors led to, to that? And, and again, I'd, li I'd like to understand more about the impact of why you can't go above ground and into the middle of Eglinton the way we see it on the Queensway by Ellis Avenue, South of Swansea. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Good questions. We did touch on some of this, um, but Josh, maybe you want to kick off. Yeah, I mean, uh, the you know, these, there's lots of moving pieces here, right? There's lots of different examples from around the city, from around the world. I think in in June, we also showed a number of best practices where we're drawing inspiration from uh, in terms of different elevated guideways from from around the world. Uh, and and we'll bring we'll bring some of those forward again. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start and then Sean, maybe you have a bit to add. Uh, just in terms of the idea of you know separated from traffic in the middle of the road um, again considerations there around you know basically requiring a widening of Eglinton Avenue both into the different uh, natural areas on either side of the road and the constraint points in terms of the bridge and Scarlet uh, are, are all different considerations that um, 
make that make that challenging and then the ability to get you know underground uh creating the the portals um needed to go into the tunnel so that's the where where we've tried to do that um on the north side of the road uh but on on either side uh reflecting the fact that the richview corridor and the the uh, vacant areas are existing to the west of eglinton north of the road and really trying to minimize uh, the impacts of construction uh, that that would happen during the construction of the guideway so that it can be separate especially separated from the traffic not you know right in the middle of the road uh, for a, a large section requiring you know very very significant uh, lane closures road closures things like that um sean is there anything you would like to add to that I think just to say that obviously when you're you're sharing a, a right of, of way, it, um, even if it's sort of exclusive in, in the middle of the, the right of way, you still have to cross the intersections. So obviously there's impacts with um, with, uh, you know, travel time there as well. Uh, and so, you know, the overall journey times people using the LRT would be impacted with with that proposal. Is there anything I'll add, Josh? And Sean, actually, if you could just add that, that was uh, Tanya's second question, uh, which had to do with uh, cut and cover versus sure. the board yep. approaches. Yes, yep. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tanya, for that question too. So uh, cost is obviously an important factor when we decide, you know, what type of tunneling methodology to to implement or propose. Um, but it's uh, it's actually only one aspect. We, we do look at lots of other criteria as well. Um, and community impacts are, are uh, you know, one of those things, impacts on um, traffic, um, property owners along that corridor, how they'd be impacted, small businesses um, would need to move a certain, you know, certainly move a lot more uh, utilities would be need, need to be diverted uh, due to a sort of open uh, cut and cover excavation. So, yes, you're, you're right, whilst cost comes into it, actually, um, it, it, there are other factors at play, but when we did the analysis, actually, the, the, the end result was that when you looked at all these different criteria in comparison, that a, a board option was the, was the, the right uh, option that offered the, the most amount of benefits for the, the least amount of, of cost overall. So, so that's why we took that, that decision. Okay, thanks. Kelly? Tanya, any, any follow-up comments to that? No, if, if not, we will head over to Mike. Uh, Mike Matos, you can unmute yourself now. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Good, okay. I've been having some AV problems. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a, a two-layer question. Last week we met with Crosstown and they're saying that we have to talk to you about construction that's currently underway on Eglinton between Piran and uh, Emmett. And your slides today say you don't start construction for another five years. And you haven't said one word about construction that's currently happening today on Eglinton between Piran and Emmett. So this really bothers me because it sounds like we're getting the same bullshit we got a few years ago when Crosstown said, oh, don't worry about it. When Go comes through Mount Dennis, we'll get it all sorted out. And then Go came through and said, no, it was settled by Crosstown and we're not going to talk to you about access to the Go platforms. And so now we have a massive transit hub and you cannot access the corners of the Go station, whereas every other Go station we ever look at has access from north, south, east, west ends of their platforms. We have to walk to Eglinton and walk through your construction site to get onto a, a go platform, which in some cases is just on the other side of a fence from where the people live on, on some of our streets. So here we go back to another thing. You're building a bicycle path on Eglinton, which today you said you're going to shut down and rip up while you build no new accesses into the park. You're going to rip up the bicycle path that is being built as we speak and you're going to close the access to the uh, to the cricket fields, and then you're going to build another access up by Piran Park, and this, this bicycle path is going to be closed for five years or something, and yet it is being built today rather than build a temporary bicycle path that you say is going to be used for the next 10 years or something during this construction phase 
and you haven't said a word to us about this. So what's going on? So Mike, I think there may be some confusion. So the construction that's happening now along Eglinton on that north side between Emmett and Pirin, that's the city of Toronto installing the multi-use path as part of, uh, as part of their capital projects for, for this year. Um, that was part of, of this engagement. We did acknowledge that that's being built now and that the decision to build it now, even though that it will have to be diverted to the south side during our construction, um, the decision was made as, as different you know, pros and cons were balanced that at least the community has, you know, they've been waiting for years for this, for this amenity and for the next couple of years anyway, they would be able to, to use the bike path. Um, so that's, that's not Metrolink's construction, but certainly when the construction begins on, on the guideway and, and the portal, that path does need to move to the south side, which we've been talking about. And to be clear, at, at no point are we blocking any access to the cricket pitches or the parks. Um, those fields will always be accessible and will never impact any programming um, or, or keep people from, from using those facilities. Um, so with that in mind, was, is, does, that, does that clear up any misconception or, or is there a, another question? Well, I, as I say, as a, a resident, we really are frustrated that we're getting ping-ponged between different organizations and we're not getting a straight answer from any of them. You may know that it's Toronto, but we know the last time they dug up Eglinton wasn't Toronto. You know, we have hydro going around digging up holes. You know, the, the place gets ripped up and we don't know who's doing what about it or what the impacts are. And that's, that's the concern is that, that you may tell us something, but that doesn't necessarily mean the actual people operating the bulldozers will talk to us, as, as you're saying now. Um, you know, the, the, the changes on the alignment of Eglinton, I thought, were part of the plan for Crosstown, you know, rather than Toronto yeah. traffic. You know, if we're going to change lane alignments on Eglinton, we, we hear about that from Crosstown every week. We get lane closures from Crosstown right now because they're putting new traffic lights at Black Creek Drive, right? Well, Jane Street's been a total disaster for most of the summer and nobody said a word to us. You know, like who is in charge of this project? Who's the general contractor? And I, and I thought it was Metrolinx. Yeah, so appreciating that there, are, there is a lot of work happening. Um, but Josh, you know, something we've talked about yep. is acknowledging that there is a lot of, of competing projects happening and that we'll have to do a good job, especially as we start working near um, uh, Mount Dennis Station of coordinating and, and bringing people, partners to the table at the same time. So any thoughts on that, Josh? Yeah, I think, I mean, Mike, I uh, appreciate your frustration. I think, you know, in this case, this is a City of Toronto project that you're referring to, but obviously we are doing lots of lots of planning uh, in, in the corridor. So it, it is understandable that you would, your first thought would be that it would be a Metrolinx project. And I think, you know, we aim to do better so that you aren't ping ponged around to the best of our ability. Uh, to the previous question about TTC engagement, I, I think we could certainly explore, um, you know, City of Toronto participation in, in future public engagements where there are these uh, kind of interfaces for sure. Uh, so that's something to to think about and and to pursue, um, and and do rest assured, you know the the construction that's happening as part of the multi-use path, the work on the multi-use path, um, you know where that's not a surprise to us. We're working closely with the city of Toronto uh, at the coordination there and making sure that there is multi-use path access to the community uh, for the entirety of the construction so that, you know, uh, the, the diversion on the south will be built before the, the uh, path on the north needs to be closed um, for, the, for the period of construction. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And we'll keep talking, Mike, for sure. Um, next up, we have David. Uh, David, you can unmute yourself now. Are you with us, David? All righty, we will, in the meantime, move on to Albert. And Albert, you can also unmute yourself. 
There we go. Okay, do you hear me? We do. Hi. Awesome. Hello. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions. My first question is that, well, it's pretty obvious that an elevated alignment that's proposed will have a lot more negative effects on the environment and on wildlife um, compared to a tunneled option under the Humber River. But one thing that I haven't seen addressed at all by Metrolinx is that the elevated alignment is also going to have a lot of effects on the mental and physical health of people who live in the area or like the people who use the park for leisurely activities, right? Because the the way the alignment is um the way the alignment is structured there's no way to not ignore there's no way to ignore that so anybody like i don't know on a leisurely walk or playing in the park they're going to be affected by a train going by every five minutes overhead so i was just wondering um has metrolinx considered any of those mental or physical um effects and my second question is uh in the presentation you mentioned that the access road is going to run pair parallel to Eglinton, um, but wouldn't that require cutting down even more trees? Because the, in the area you indicated by the portal, you're already going to have to remove a bunch of trees there, but the access road is going to have to remove even more. So what is Metrolinx going to do about that? Thank you. Yeah, that, very good questions. Um, so I think, I think the, in terms of the mental health, I think where it, the focus of that issue would be the noise or the sound of the trains that, that you're suggesting will be obtrusive um, in their frequency. So um, we do have some folks on the panel who can, who can address that. Uh, so I will pass it over to Josh to see who's there to do that. Yeah, thanks Kelly. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think um, I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Amir in a second who, so who's not, on uh, video, but certainly on on the call to address noise and, and vibration specifically. Um, but Albert, maybe I'll answer your second question uh, first. So your your question about the access road, uh, and it's a it is a, a good question. Um, part of part of the reason for that access road uh, being where it is, and one of the considerations in the assessment is that 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 road uh, will need to be built for construction purposes. So uh, trucks or other equipment can access uh, the portal uh, both to to you know to construct it to remove the the soil there, those kinds of things. So we'll basically be replacing the construction access there with the permanent road so we will not be uh taking out any additional trees or vegetation associated with or or certainly very very small amount associated with putting the the road there so that is hopefully that addresses that question uh specifically with respect to noise and and vibration um and and we've said this in in uh in previous uh public engagements um we've been doing some uh, getting some more specific modeling work done of of noise uh, in in the park, um, largely uh, similar to background levels. Uh, however, maybe Amir, you can provide a little bit more detail and uh, you know the Albert's specific question around the elevated guideway. Thanks, Josh. I think you explained it well. Um, elevated guideway passed by noise impact has been assessed. Uh, definitely you're going to be able to hear the train go by, but the impact is of short duration, a few seconds. And when you take that into consideration, the criteria that has been designed for pass by is for human annoyance that's linked to, I wouldn't directly call it a mental impact or health impact, but uh, uh, as human annoyance is taken into consideration when you're, when you're looking at a pass by noise, level of 80 dBA. Uh, that modeling assessment has been done. You're in ground uh, that are absorptive. So the expected noise level that you're going to hear in the park is obviously significantly lower than 80 dBA and the expected impact will be minimal. So you're saying, Amir, when we say 80 dBA, you mean that's the amount that it a typical person would experience annoyance and that it's well below that, just to clarify. No, no, the ADDBA is the noise that you're going to hear at the track. So the tracks, as the LRT goes by, it's not going to exceed ADDBA. There's obviously propagation of noise from source to receiver. The receiver will be a person that will be used in the park. 
Uh, there will be absorptive uh, parameters with respect to ground and atmospheric absorption that happens for the sound as it, as it propagates from source to receiver. What we're saying here is one, it's a short duration of a few seconds for the train to go by, and two, the impact will be mitigated through distance and the fact that you have absorptive grounds in the park. Uh, and 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 I'll just add, and then I think Elmira may have a little bit more uh, detail to provide as well uh, to your question, Albert. Is that we are also, you, you know, this is not a a streetcar where you, you know you hear a lot of noise as the trains go over like crossing tracks. Um, there are a number of things that we continue to look at to minimize any noise and vibration. So uh, the seamlessly welded rails and putting the, the actual tracks on, uh, you know, absorptive uh, surfaces like rubber uh, to really minimize the noise and vibration. And uh, sorry, Elmira, was there something you'd like to add as well? Uh, you and Amir covered everything. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we are just uh, just to give an update that we are uh, we are doing additional modeling for the park uh, to uh, get the noise and vibration level at the park uh, for different with different receptors uh, along Fergie Brown Park, Pierron Park, and uh, in future engagements we will be ready to share those uh, uh, results. So uh, just please stay tuned. To get okay, so, so more specific details there to come. Thanks, Elmira. Yeah, and Josh, if I may add a couple more points, um, just to not confuse the two, uh, in being LRT versus a subway train, this is a lightweight, short length vehicle that goes by through this elevated guideway. And uh, the pass, the passing through elevated guideway is going to be a few seconds. Um, as you said, mitigation at track, the noise generated is electric, so the noise generated is primarily the interaction between the wheels and the tracks. And there are mitigation measures that are implemented and will be implemented as part of the study to make sure that the criteria is met at the nearby receptors. Great. Thank you, Amir. Uh, Kelly, back to you. Okay, thanks. So, Albert, that was a lot of information. I, I also want to, to let you know that we will have the advantage of the, the cross town operating over that elevated guideway. So we will have an opportunity when that's running to, to go and, and take groups of people and, and listen to it. Um, that service is, is scheduled to begin at the end of next year. But in the meantime, the, the Crosslinks is testing the LRVs along the route. And what we're planning to do is get a schedule of when they'll be driving over the uh, on the elevated guideway at Black Creek so that we can let residents know and we can plan to be there and, and experience that firsthand. So that's, it's a lot of information. Some of it is quite technical. And what it comes down to is what, what you're going to hear in, in real life. So we'll take advantage of those opportunities to, to make that happen so you can experience that. Okay, was there any, any last comments from you, Albert, before we move on? Okay, um, thanks, Albert. If not, we, uh, Neeland, you seem to have some, some follow-up questions. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, uh, we have maybe five minutes left in this room. Nope. Um, uh, okay, so we'll go on to Rick. Did you wanna unmute and, and ask follow-up questions? Yes, please. Um, one of the concerns, um, given Mount Dennis's designation as an eco neighborhood, is uh, looking at construction from a sustainability standpoint. So we know you use a lot of concrete, you use a lot of steel, um, you're electric, which is good. You talked about um, putting um, backup systems in, which I hope are, are part of the renewables. But can you showcase some of the thinking that's going on behind sustainable design? And the second question is really, again, one that's been raised at the, the last couple of meetings. Eglinton 
um, Crosstown as it goes over the Black Creek is an example of how not to build a, a guideway. So what is it that you're going to be doing that's going to be different? We were promised for that Black Creek connection when Barrage did his mobility study that it would be one of the most beautiful bridges in Toronto. And you can go and ask him. Okay, uh, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Do you, do you want us to kick that off, Josh, uh, that last second question? Yeah, well, maybe I'll start, I'll start with the first question, um, just with regards to sustainable design. Uh, and appreciate the question, Rick. Um, I'm sure we'll have uh, further conversations on this, but uh, so a number of things. Obviously, we look at the environmental benefits, the greenhouse gas reductions uh, from the actual operation of the line and, you know, uh, reducing auto use and encouraging more people to travel sustainably. So that's one of the measures that's included in our business case. Uh, you asked about concrete and materials. And, and certainly we also consider uh, the embodied energy uh, of 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 the material. We have we we will be doing some analysis uh, associated with that and looking at opportunities for the use of more sustainable materials. We also uh, apply kind of a climate lens view to that. Uh, in in addition, we do uh, an analysis of uh, climate uh, change mitigation. Um, so increased risk of flooding, uh, you know, uh, extreme temperatures and do a, a kind of a risk analysis of what that may mean for the for the line and what mitigation measures exist as well to make sure that, you know, this is a, an investment for many, many decades to come and that it can continue to, to function well and function safely. Um, with regards to your second question about design, um, we, we certainly have had lessons learned sessions with the City of Toronto's design department where they've kind of very clearly picked out elements in the Black Creek Guideway where we are looking to learn our lessons and, and make changes. Um, so that is something that we're definitely taking into consideration. I, I appreciate your feedback there. Um, Sean, was there anything you wanted to add with respect to the design of the guideway and, uh, you know, how we're thinking about that and how that could be uh, in particular different from or some of the lessons learned from the from the other guideway? Yeah, so I'll just highlight a couple of the key things that we did, we are looking at. So, um, in particular, it was pointed out at Black Creek, you know, about a, a potential abrupt transitions and, um, you know, highly visual kind of uh, drainage pipes and things like that. We are working to um, uh, make the aesthetics, you know, a, a little bit better and improve on, on what, what you can see at, at Black Creek. Uh, and, and really, we're at a key stage of, of the project where um, we, we can start to, you know, define some of these requirements uh, into, a, into a, an RFP that goes out to market. Um, so there will be some uh, material that that be coming out, I think, in the next uh, engagement, which is in October. Um, the latest updates on the guideway aesthetics. Uh, we'll also be considering things like the OCS, the, the catenary system that supports the electrification and how we can make that look a little bit less cluttered. Um, so, so yeah, that there are obviously lessons learned that we, we need to be looking at and um, stay tuned that we'll be bringing that to the, this forum shortly. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so we have time, I think, for one more question, and we're going to pass the mic over to Lewis. Um, Lewis, you're, you can unmute yourself now. Uh, Lewis, do you hear us? Oh, there we go. Hi, Lewis. Oh, here you go. Okay. Go. Hello. Okay. Uh, my worry about all of this, all this sounds okay to a point, um, is safety. Has anyone during all this construction, all of this moving around of vehicles and so on, thought of um, 
audible lights for people. Safety is it in everybody's mind. I hope so. Regarding uh, walkable sidewalks, uh, large vehicles being moved around, people with whatever kind of mobility issues, um, having to use the sidewalks if they can, or even having to go on the road, whatever. Um, somebody should re- seriously look into this before somebody people start getting hurt in the middle of all of this. And also, audible lights would be nice. Um, wherever they they can be put in already, even because of the large vehicles. So this is my point. Um, that that's it for now. Thanks. Thanks, Louis. So does it, the team have any comments about um, ensuring accessibility for for all sorts of pedestrians and and users with varying abilities and and what what uh, what's put into the prescription for the contractors to follow? Uh, thanks, Kelly. So maybe I'll I'll start uh, responding to Lewis's question, and I can pass it to Elmira. Um, I think we we showed in the presentation just as an example uh, in about how we're thinking about safety that on the hoarding at the launch shaft construction site, we have we have messaging around you know safety pedestrian safety around large trucks. Uh, when they're kind of backing up or moving forwards, they're blind spots. So to make sure that you can always see the driver, just as an example. Um, but uh, I think that safety thinking is very important. Elmira, can you speak to uh, just a little bit of detail about how we ensure safety around the construction site? Uh, sure, Josh. So uh, during our design constructability review, uh, different construction site along the project, uh, we looked at how we can provide enough space for the construction to make a safe environment in and outside of the hoarding, uh, considering enough setback from the traffic lane, uh, providing, for example, for elevated guideway and tunnel portal, moving uh, MUP on the south side, providing access uh, to the um, cyclists, to the pedestrian, and making sure that uh, the, we, we have lessons learned from previous projects, what happened, uh, what incidents we, we heard about, and make sure that uh, we consider all those in our contract documents, making sure that contractor follows all those requirements in our contract documents. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks Elmira. Okay. And then, of course, uh, Lewis, I think just the location of the of the construction area and our our goal with the project as much as we can is to separate the construction sites uh, from the road, from the sidewalk, from some of the key places that that folks are moving around regular safety reviews. Um, and and you know and re- and safety requirements. So those are all all things. But it, again, you know, if anyone sees anything uh, that they are concerned about, please get in touch with us uh, so that we can just collectively ensure that things are safe. But uh, hopefully that helps to answer your question. Okay. Part of the issue. Part of the issue could be what you don't see. Yeah, it, it's true, yeah. Lewis. And it, so, yeah, Josh, what we're talking, you know, if if um, transit users or pedestrians have uh, a seeing impairment. So, Lewis, I think we will, we've started a very good conversation here and also offline, and we'll continue to, to talk about, you know, the the construction staging plans as they become known. And Gurjeet and I will make sure that that we get your advice on that and make sure that the information is accessible because you're absolutely right it's 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 certainly safety is number one in everything that we're doing um but your advice and and other people's advice in actual you know actually navigating those spaces that are being created is is what will make us ensure that it's safe so let's keep talking and we'll, we'll figure it out okay thank you okay Okay, well, thanks everyone. It's it's we're a little after eight, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Joseph to close us out. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you to everybody who asked the questions in the Zoom room. This is the end of tonight's session, but it's not the end of engagement with Metrolinx. Uh, your questions uh, were heard, um, and Metrolinx will be back again. In the meantime. 
Uh, you can always contact Mectrolinx right on the upper right hand corner of the screen is a green contact button. You can find the email link. You can send emails to Metrolinx. You can join their mailing list and stay and come back to this site uh, tomorrow. You'll see a replay of the video over time. Metrolinx will respond to the major questions that you've asked here tonight. And you'll see availabilities for the future meetings. So thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you to Joshua, Elmira, Yen, and Sean. Thank you, Kelly. Stay home, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll see you the next time. Good night.